Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I probably should say uh, these are all my own views, um, um, but I'm able to have my own views because I work for Historic England. So um, they have they go hand in hand, but they are they are my own. Um, it's now nearly 30 years since PPG 16 introduced the concept of the developer pays in mitigating the impact of development uh, on archaeology in Britain. And I have benefited from this fundamental change. I started university in 1990, so in a sense it's been all of my academic and professional career. Um, I have built my career out of it, I've built my career around it, I have been really lucky, I've made some wonderful discoveries. Um, projects I've been involved have made some wonderful discoveries. In fact, if you wanted a little bit of sneak advice, don't ask me onto your archaeological site because lots of things tend to get found and I cost people lots and lots of money. Okay? I have met some inspirational archaeologists. I have uh, worked with groundbreaking and pioneering scientists developing extraordinary techniques to extract every ounce of knowledge from the material culture we excavate. I've worked in some of the most amazing places, mainly in Yorkshire. It is the world's most amazing place. <laughs> and with a deep interest, uh, uh, deeply interested communities and supportive developers. And in this process, I've been really lucky. I've made some lifelong friends. It's a great business to be in. It really is. To me, it's all around people. But over this time, I find what I come away with now is a whole load of questions. I don't seem to have answers in my head. I have lots and lots of questions, and they're just struggling to get out. And so what I've tried to do is just sort of write down my questions and actually get them into some sort of thought, and that's what this paper is really about. Um, it's just sort of reflecting on, I don't know, who I am, where I've got to. Uh, it's scary. Is this because I'm now getting old? Okay, so uh, yes, I'm definitely going grey and I'm definitely losing my hair. Where am I in my career? The best thing is I'm not halfway through my career yet because the government keeps putting the pension age up. So uh, I've still got a good 20 years to go. Okay, what's going to happen in that time? But one of the things I keep coming back to when I think about archaeology is what is it and who does it and how do we do it? And are we really having an impact in, in the approaches we take? To me, archaeology in England is defined by archaeologists, for archaeologists, with outputs overwhelmingly um, uh, designed for archaeologists. Now, whilst we might do this under the mask of public benefit, in reality, our approach to archaeology as a sector and the continued implementation of the approach founded in PPG, PPG 16 is extremely inward-looking. And frankly, so much of it is boring. I also find that continuing to implement this approach is now becoming increasingly problematic. The sheer amount of material being excavated is placing a huge strain on numerous parts of the process. The new resources we're going to need to deal with some of the infrastructure coming forward is going to place even more strain on some of the uh, resources and some of the uh, structures we actually have. But also, I think sometimes when we look at this subject, we become really... Um, introverted. We just keep looking inwards at the sector. What's the problem with the sector? Rather than actually looking outward and saying, how might we redefine our outputs to deal with some of these challenges as, we, as they come, up, come, up, come across us? So, I, I'd like us to think about what it is we do, how we do it, and who do we do it for. And in some ways, again, my paper is a distillation of the things that I've encountered over the last 28 years as both an academic and a professional. And what's interesting, the only way I could illustrate this is, here is my photo archive. This is a brain dump of everything I've been lucky enough to come in contact with. And so as you look at that, this is the sort of breadth of the stuff we encounter. Okay. So if you ask me what, it's, uh, what we're actually looking at, it's about how we engage in exploring the material culture of past generations. It is about the present and how we derive meaning from this material and how we discuss it and use it in the present. It's about heritage management and what archaeology has to offer within this very dynamic and creative sector. It's about how archaeology, in my opinion, should really look to redefine its outputs to maximise its impact. <coughs> and it's about some of my concerns about the over-professionalisation of our sector. Archaeology started as a volunteer exercise. It started with people testing things, testing ideas. 
Are we losing that as we seek to have more professional standards and more guidance and more very clear ways of doing things? I really do think that this structure we have now is not capable of meeting the development challenges of the 21st century and, in particular, what the public now wants from heritage participation. But then again, was it ever meant to? Um, the process set out under PPG, PPG 16 was never there to address issues of participation, place and identity because these weren't the issues of the time. So in a sense, it never gave us the tools or the approaches we now need to successfully address this agenda. What concerns me most about the current approach is how some of the concepts have become so institutionalised that they are wielded like an, a set of unbreakable laws or as I often tell people, like um, the unforgivable curses in Harry Potter. These are used to maintain the right of the archaeologist to keep digging, to keep them employed, to keep them churning the mill to create more and more stuff with seemingly no thought as to why or what or who we're doing it for, or indeed what to do with all the stuff that's generated. To my mind, these can be attributed to three key concepts. Archaeology is a finite and non-renewable resource. Once lost, it's lost forever. I've never known the number of archaeological sites to go down. Do historic environments have less records on them now than they did when we started? Preservation and protection of archaeological sites and archaeological knowledge is our primary purpose. And that we must create records, lists, archives about the past. We're never satisfied until we actually put it in a document. That's where it actually must be. Now, I'm not saying these aren't worthy aspirations, and they are important concepts, but to me, they don't actually fit with that broader definition of archaeology as the study of humanity and its past. Archaeologists study things that were created, used, or changed by humans. They do this by studying the material remains, the stuff those people left behind. And we often draw on contemporary societies and experiences in order to shed light on those that flourished or struggled in the world before us. Archaeology isn't about the past, it's of the present. It's a process and activity done in the present, reflecting our values, values of the present. And it often tells us more about who we are as a society than it answers questions about the past. Um, and I'm really concerned that those three concepts I set out have actually become an end in themselves rather than just the beginning of the process. They boxed us into a reactionary and negative outlook. They stifled our purpose. They had given us a philosophical straitjacket we can't get out of. But I feel we must. I think we must refocus on the cultural value of our interventions, the knowledge gain of interventions, the social gain from understanding uh, and the discussions, conservation, conservation, conversations set up by our interventions. In some ways, the fun of doing it, of being there, of actually participating. I think we need to do this to actually redefine a different legacy. Where do we want our interventions to actually take us? I don't think it'll be easy, and we heard some of that this morning, because I think we're fastened into a really tight straitjacket. Preservation quickly leads on to concepts of preservation in situ, the idea that we can leave the stuff in the ground, and it will be preserved for future generations, to the idea of sampling. Well, we don't need to take it all, we just take a tiny little bit of it, and that, that's going to tell us everything, and we're going to know about it. Okay? Um, and what we love to do, it develops swathes and swathes of guidance and advice notes about how we do this, how we preserve it, how we sample little tiny bits of it, how we, always we, do this process. And then when we can't actually preserve something in the ground, we've come up with this great idea. We're just going to justify what we do by preserving it by record, i.e. it's fine. We'll lose one bit, but we'll gain another bit. Now, I don't necessarily disagree with all that, but I find our language is really, really retrospective. It's so negative in how we want to present what we do. And finally, as I said, we put it all in the historic environment record, and we make that record available to the public as if we've done our job. Well, I'll reiterate, I personally think this is a record of the past produced by experts for experts through expert-managed systems and structures. I find it a hardly compelling project, uh, product, 
and one increasingly overlooked by the academic community who see little more value in it than a process of artefact collection. Well, for the wider community, I'd say they'd find it wholly impenetrable. How might we, how might we challenge that? But looking at that wider community, the other, the other aspect I'm really um, challenged with at the moment is how we deal with them. If we're lucky, we will think about the non-expert and we'll undertake outreach or we'll go for a bit of engagement, okay? As if it's some lesser output. It's some fluffy thing that we're not really allowed to do. We're going to sneak it in there by the back door and we're actually, uh, we're, going to, we're going to call it something safe and easy. We're going to move, remove them from some of the critical discussions and issues that we're going to do. Indeed, within my own organisation, I've been told that outreach is not proper mitigation for a development, okay, because it's not actually dealing with the direct effects of that development, okay. Indeed, if you go and look at the National uh, Planning Policy Framework and you look at the definition of archaeological interest, it, it actually says in there um, that archaeological interest in a heritage asset, if it holds or potentially may hold evidence of past human activity, worthy of expert investigation. Now, if you want to understand the implication of that, when I do talks to communities, and I've done them where I've had both archaeologists and uh, <coughs> local residents in there, I read that out, I ask all the professional archaeologists to stand up and walk to one side of the roof, and I tell everyone else they're not allowed in this process, because this says there you've got to be an expert. What are we saying by that? Why are we actually saying that? So, what if? What if we wanted to change this? What might happen if we changed this? My first what if is, what might happen if we didn't dig up all the material in the first place? Are we actually doing too much archaeology? If we're concerned about resources, let's stop doing it. Okay. My question is, are there actually enough academics around to actually look at some of the material we're actually producing? If they're not, what are we producing it for? Why are we actually adding it to the backlog that we already have? What would happen if we think, did things differently with the material we excavate? What would happen if we changed the purpose and objectives of archaeological work to focus less on the outputs and needs of experts and instead focus more on the outputs relating to the community, the place, the identity of the people from which the material has come from and to which it relates, which I think was some of the things that Richard was saying um, this morning. Uh, sorry, Roger was saying this morning. Um, we don't actually have to excavate everything. We can decide not to dig. We can decide to do other things. Heritage management is a set of human decisions based on the circumstances of any proposal or place or issues at any given time. There is no law saying we actually have to do it. There is nothing to say we have to record all the material we encounter or that we all have to record it to a certain <coughs> way in a certain set of standards. An approach that sees us digging less might actually allow us more time and space to use the material and the knowledge generated by excavations that we really want to do, both in the academic context and with the public, and then take that material and do something more creative with it. I think this sort of approach would allow us to deliver far greater impact and public benefit from the interventions we make. I certainly see this as a question we have to ask. I see it as an opportunity to ask fundamental questions about what we see as the public benefit offered by archaeology and archaeologists and how we might redefine that better. I've always understood archaeology as a process, a way of exploring and asking questions about the material culture we encounter and the people who created it, who used it and who often abandoned it or lost it. Archaeology is not an end product. It's not the end of the process. Yet often it likes to define itself as giving answers to our questions about the past. I often encounter archaeologists who tell facts about the past as if they have uncovered the truth and that they have written the history of a place that will remain that way for future generations. One of the fundamental parts of my uh, delving into academia was actually to look at the very process of how archaeology as a historic subject has changed and evolved over time, and heritage management. They've never been static. Archaeological theory and concepts have constantly changed. So again, this idea that we want to write the perfect past, I have real problems with on occasions. 
because it's not, it's dynamic, it's fundamentally changing all the time. I also think that approach of wanting to find out about the past and write about the past actually downplays the greatest asset archaeology has, the ability to ask, set and explore questions about places, people and the past with the very people who live there and occupy those places today. So Roger was really clear about how we might lose localism to get local, very local research frameworks. I want to know how do we get the people to write the questions? How do we get them to set our agenda more directly? I don't believe we can ever uncover the truth about the past, as the entire process is far too subjective, and the facts that we might want to present are far too open to interpretation. And I think we should just lighten up about that and just accept it, because actually there's a lot of energy and power when you actually get to that place. Subjectivity, we should see as our greatest opportunity to engage with people, to help them set and understand the questions they may have about themselves, their place, their story, their past and their society. Helping people and society develop the tools to shape and ask these questions and to investigate and explore and discover their place, their past and their identity should be our primary purpose. I'm often struck how limited our audience is for some of the professional work we do, Yet how huge the wide-ranging enthusiasm for the subject is as a whole. People are fascinated by the endless questions of who do you think you are and what's the story of my place? Yet again, as I say, we seem to belittle this professionally, this subcategory of academic excellence known as outreach or engagement. Okay? I don't believe that's what we should be doing. They should be our primary purpose. Now... Don't get me wrong, I'm not about putting down the importance of rigorous uh, uh, academic <coughs> approach to archaeology. Okay? It's an essential element of our work, and when we increase our knowledge about the past, we demonstrate how, in part, we benefit society. I feel we just need to do much more about how we apply that knowledge. Um, I see a refocusing of our outputs as a way to create the space to bring academic, professional and the community back into a more mutual partnership in asking and defining those questions we really see value in focusing on. Okay? The, the knowledge gain of anything we do must be a key component, it must be a key output. How does knowledge gain drive what we actually do? But I'm strongly behind the idea of putting people, communities and society first in considering the outputs of our work. At present, we're very happy to say we do it in the name of the public, but in reality, we, tra we rarely translate this into positive action. All of our engagement tends to be done on our terms. Practice shows that we will bring the public in when we have something to say or some finds to show off. Rarely do we embed them in the process of setting and shaping the questions, the agendas that we and they might want to look at when we start to ask questions about places, or the, uh, the whole concept of the questions they would like to ask about places. I strongly believe we need to invest in a more public first set of outputs which are not focused on preservation, archiving, or the creation of endless lists. These are just technical aspects of our work and often strip away the very <coughs> main element of the process that makes archaeology so captivating. The thrill of the search, the find, the knowledge gain, the experience of just doing it. We need to stop doing <coughs> heritage conservation <coughs> by audit as, the, as it benefits no one in the long term and, res, and results in just another long list of stuff. My, my clearest example I can give you about this, we have been doing a project in York around Clifford's Tower and the Eye of York. Okay, it's been a really difficult site to develop for over 20 years. You know, a new project started, new set of consultants, and at the very beginning I told the set of consultants, please don't give me a heritage audit, I know what the designated assets are here. Okay, what did I get at the first sentence in their report? This site consists of these designated heritage assets. They didn't even touch on what the significance of this place was. Okay, or what it meant to the people who were actually there. Archaeologists fundamentally need to get better at understanding the places they work in so that they can <coughs> start to articulate the values that people in those places might have or ascribe to things. Archaeology, as I said, needs to be about place shaping. It needs to be about cultural experience. 
and the creation of cultural value and understanding. To me, this is a much broader definition of public benefit for archaeology, as an engaging and democratic process directly linked to the right of everyone to engage in this process, the right to help shape outputs, to participate in sustaining the material culture we act, encounter, and actively to shape the values we ascribe to the stuff we excavate. This is not a new concept, a force for our future, power of place had it. It's a fundamental concept of the first two principles of Historic England's conservation principles. The historic environment is a shared resource, and everyone should be able to participate in sustaining the historic environment. Okay. They're 20 and 10 years old, respectively, those documents, yet they still have failed to deliver a comprehensive change in practice, approach, or outputs. Now, I've, again, I'm working in England, so I would say it's, it's England. I think some of the things we heard this morning, you know, there are different approaches in the home nations that are taking things different ways. But why are they failing? Um, in my experience, the answer is simple. It's been really easy for us to change our language. So we, we do outreach, we do inclusion, but actually we haven't changed our practice. We haven't actually changed the way we really do things. We haven't done that fundamental change that I would, uh, I would want to see. <coughs> Good one, Matt. Uh, we are even more reluctant to go out to the public and ask them to set the questions for us. Yep. Instead, we choose to, behind, to hide behind the veil of expert and expertise to sustain our self-justification in, in our right, the right of the professional, to set the questions and dictate the agenda. Now, I'm not, I'm not here to belittle the role of the expert. I'm, I'm constantly told, told I am an expert. I work for Historic England, so I am an expert. Okay? What I'm really interested in is how we use our expertise. To me, it breaks down into two areas, knowledge and skills. Okay? And actually, when I go to most places, I seem to gain a lot more knowledge from the people who actually live and work there than I necessarily bring to those places. So not why I like talking about knowledge is a two-way transfer thing. It goes backwards and forwards. What are the skills, what are the skills I need to do that really well? Again, some of the presentations we heard this morning, empathy came up a few times. The ability to listen better. How do we actually do that? But also in that process, what am I really probably asking for? Well, personally, it's about the public benefit of the work we do. What's the public benefit of archaeology and heritage? To me, it breaks down into two main areas. One, this whole idea of knowledge gain. What knowledge are we going to gain? What do we think we're going to learn by intervention into places? And then the second one is this whole concept of wider cultural participation. Um, yesterday I spoke about heritage as democracy. It's about cultural understanding. It's about cultural empowerment. Okay? It's not about outreach. These are people's fundamental rights. It's their stuff to actually engage in it. There's huge amounts of energy in that. How do we untap and actually look at that? So I'd say we're relatively good at first, um, the first one, but we need to focus much more energy on looking at the second of those two outputs. Maybe, dare I even say, put it first. Maybe that's the thing that should be our primary objective. And what am I really saying by actually doing that? I think we need to, I think we need to change, in some ways, our, 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 our outlook. Um, I am really passionate about trying to understand what is the cultural, uh, sorry, what is the cultural legacy of our interventions, okay? I find it very interesting when you go to a site and you talk, what's the mitigation strategy? <clears throat> the mitigation strategy takes you down a very set, set of formula that will lead to a set product. I don't want to talk about mitigation. I want to talk about our interventions and their cultural legacy. Because when you talk about it like that, you can bring in all sorts of outputs, all sorts of different ways about talking about the past, dealing with the past, that become possible to, to, to value out and have as a proper thing. Now, where do you do that? To me, it's about getting proper project designs. Project designs that don't have a fluffy section saying outreach, but actually have that product in the main purpose of the project design. Because that is actually the most valuable place we probably live in and where we should actually be. It's where people are, and it's where we can demonstrate really what all our skills are. 
I think there we can also grab hold of some of these really brilliant concepts that are out there. Um, citizen science, yeah? What do we saw if all those people are the greatest uh, amount of resource for us? How might we actually uh, use that in, in that sense? I'm really, really clear about this idea that around place shaping, we're actually talking about belonging and democracy. Okay? So this is a really important thing where we should be placing ourselves. We shouldn't be there saying we're the people bringing facts and the answers. We're bringing the method to discuss, debate. We're bringing the ability to actually start setting question agendas and seeking how people might look at taking those forward. I see it as a public-focused debate in which the expert acts as a facilitator, a friendly advocate, a champion for the public. If we allow ourselves to consider the wider impacts of the broader conversation, we can start to really think about how we de deliver a much broader and a much more sustainable impact. I'm very clear, we have to think about who we are. We have to derive an understanding of our place our places um, from how we help set up cons conversations about them and how development then might shape our places. I want to know what role archaeology plays in place shaping. Okay, I see it as a way of us actually starting to define places at the very moment they're being created. We can go in and set up these conversations about places and again you know, I'm not totally critical. These things are starting to happen in places, okay, where archaeology is being used not due to the archaeology, but it's actually to get the people into the place. So you actually start to create an identity about a place and actually how those interactions work. So really, to me, it's about moving away from this endless creation of lists, the desk-based heritage audits that say little about meaning, um, to one of more uh, directly of community ownership and participation. It's about the public defining the questions, but what, what they want to ask, um, and creating a more sustainable purpose. Ultimately, to me, it's about creativity and not preservation. The job we do is all about creating cultural value. It's about recognising cultural value. We should see ourselves as a creative <coughs> industry. Okay? We are no different to the arts in that process. And it's really important that actually we start doing that. That's why we should be able to use all their techniques about how we uh, interpret and tell the stories that we actually encounter. 